Boy, I was uh, at a seminar, and uh, those of you who are not familiar with church growth, if you're not in the pastoral ministry and you're not really, uh, hey, Danny, we're kind of getting that same, uh, there we go, okay. I thought, uh, you know, I thought the end was coming. I wasn't sure. But uh, those of you who are not familiar with, like, the church growth aspect of, of ministry, and there's been kind of this, this, uh, this thing that's gone through the church that teaches us how it is that, you know, the church can grow. And so they spend a lot of time talking about methodology and that kind of thing. And I know early in my ministry, um, uh, I was really into this because I would watch these guys who were really the big wigs, you know, they had the big churches and I thought, I need to find out how they do it. But you know the problem with it is I was at a seminar one time and I listened to all of this methodology and I didn't hear in the, in the message at all that what really they need to do is to meet Jesus. Now, he may have assumed that. There may have been an assumption there. And I'm not the kind of guy who says it's either church growth or people are going to meet Jesus. I believe in the genius of the end. It can be both. But I think there's a great danger in forgetting that really what we need to do is bring people to Jesus. And that's exactly what's happened today. All of you had the opportunity to not just hear a sermon, but to say, what do I need Jesus to be in my life? And so I just pray God will bless that in your life today. Would you turn over to, uh, in our remaining time, let's turn to uh, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. That's one of the reasons why we're studying through the Gospels. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is every Sunday have you an, have an encounter with Jesus of the Bible. For you to be able to have the opportunity to learn about Jesus, to watch his life, to find out what it was that he did and how he operated, how he dealt with people, what he did with healing, what he did in interaction in crowds, and all these kind of things because we want to learn from Jesus Christ and we want to have him help us. So today we're in verse 17, Luke chapter 5, verse 17. We've covered a lot of ground already. Jesus has begun his, um, his earthly ministry and he's up in Galilee and he has uh, now been... Uh, ordained by the Father to begin this ministry. And we see that as he begins, he calls his disciples. He's in Capernaum. Uh, they, they have this tremendous uh, healing service. They, we see a demon-possessed man, uh, the demon driven out of him. We see people coming one right after another to meet with Jesus. And then he travels around to the different towns. And last week, Jesus was just in a town, doesn't tell us which town, but probably somewhere near near the, the Sea of Galilee, somewhere around Gennesaret, or Capernaum, one of those little towns up there, and a man full of leprosy comes up to Jesus, and uh, knowing that Jesus could meet his need, he risks being in the town, goes to Jesus and said, Jesus, if you are willing, I know that you can make me clean. And what did Jesus do? He touched him and said, I am willing, be clean. And this man had the encounter with Jesus. Can you imagine what it was like for that man? Wouldn't you love to have talked to that guy the next week or the next two weeks? I suppose he just went back to his humdrum life, didn't he? Oh, woe is me. Gotta go back. I'll bet his life was revolutionized. Changed. Why? Because of his encounter with Jesus. And so today we're going to look at another guy who had an encounter with Jesus. He was paralyzed, and uh, we're going to find out about some friends who actually brought Jesus, uh, this man to Jesus. So let's read it. If you uh, look again in verse 17, One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to make, take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. 
The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man, notice this, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been laying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe. Note that in your Bibles. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will come and meet us here today in a way that you know we need to met, be met with the Word of God. Teach us today what you want us to know. Show us from the life of Jesus what the Christian life is about, what the kingdom of God is like. And Lord, help us this morning to be as in awe of Jesus as that paralytic was over 2,000 years ago. So God, we ask for you to come and minister in the name of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Lord, I humble myself this before, you, before you this morning and ask that you would use my words in any way that you choose, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus is uh, probably in Capernaum because uh, we look over in the book of Mark and we notice that, that it's in Capernaum that he heals the paralytic. And uh, Jesus is at somebody's home. He's probably at Peter's house in Capernaum. Could have been Peter's mother-in-law, but he's in a home and people are packing around the house. As you can imagine, they're packing around the house and, and they're trying to, to see Jesus heal. They're trying to listen to his teaching. They're trying to get as close to him as they possibly can. And so uh, Jesus is teaching and notice, this is the first time that we really see it, but some bad actors come on the scene. It's like a play. And now uh, people have been hearing about all that's happening in the ministry of Jesus. And so as in every play, you have to have a bad actor who comes in, right? I mean, how much fun is it if it's just good characters? You know, it, you have to have some bad actors. And so these bad actors of the religious leadership show up. They heard that Jesus has been healing and teaching. And quite honestly, what we're going to see is that these guys become very jealous of Jesus' ministry. In fact, he, Jesus begins at this point to have a number of, uh, of conflicts with these guys. In verse 17 through 26 that we're reading today, they question Jesus' authority to forgive sins. And they're going, what, what are you talking about? You can't do that. Verses 27 through 32, they question, why is it that you're uh, uh, going to these tax collectors' home? You can't be hanging around with those kind of riffraff, that kind of scum. So they question that. Then Jesus compares their legalistic religion to brittle old wineskins that can't hold the new wine. That didn't go over well with them. They didn't like that. And then we see in uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, that uh, they find fault with his disciples and they're healing on the Sabbath day. And they say, what are you doing, Jesus? You can't be healing on the Sabbath day. Wherever Jesus shows up and wherever Jesus' healing shows up, there will always be people who want to conflict it who want to uh, try to come against it and try to press against it. And so these bad actors show up, the religious Pharisees. These are going to become the thorn in the flesh, the burr under the saddle for Jesus. And what's interesting is, is that they're religious. Do you know one of the greatest challenges to the Christian life, one of the, one of the deadliest poisons to the church, you know what it is? Being religious. Being religious, just being religious, Try, you know, trying to get some rituals that we come. We come to church because we're religious. We do these things. You know, what we need every Sunday is not a religious observance. We need an encounter with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And there is nothing worse than a group of people who never encounter Jesus, but they have this wonderful religious ritual that they go through. They come to church, they sit there, they're good, they wear their nice clothes, but they never encounter Christ.